Hello and welcome to I Know Dino. I'm Garrett. And I'm Sabrina. And today in our 483rd episode, we've got a bunch of hadrosauroid or ornithopod news, including a new monograph on Mantellosaurus, which is a really awesome iguanodontian you've seen if you've ever been to the Natural History Museum in London. Yes, there's also a new lambiosaurine that was found in Morocco. Nice. And a few papers that have to do with dinosaur growth and why hadrosaurs were so successful. Yeah, because we all know that at the end of the Cretaceous, hadrosaurs were booming. Mm-hmm. And I've got a fun fact, which is about an animal that shrank as it got older. Well, don't forget, we also have dinosaur of the day, Titanoceratops. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> But before we get into all of that, of course, we want to thank some of our patrons. And this week we have 10 patrons to thank. They are Seamus B., Histology Saurus, Chris, Buffy, Timo from Pro Art Cut, Brosis Girl, Ecosaurus, Ryan, David, and Cassidy. Thank you so much. We really appreciate all of your support. We love our Dino at All community. Big time. And now, jumping into the news, I'm starting off because I've got the new dinosaur of this week. We're actually behind by a couple of dinosaurs. Yeah, we were going to do a Spinosaurus <laughs> to kick it off because whenever we have an episode that's mostly about ornithopods, people don't get super excited about it. And I want to lure people in with a Spinosaur and they'll be like, surprise, it's mostly about ornithopods. Hmm. I don't know how well that would have worked out. We decided not to, partly because we had so much ornithopod stuff to talk about. So the Spinosaur just has to wait. <laughs> <laughs> It'll be in another episode. So if you want to hear about that, it's coming up. But this Lambiosaurine is pretty cool. Like I said, it was found in Morocco and its name is Mancaria bata. This was published in Scientific Reports by Nicholas Longrich and others. As a recap, Lambiosaurines, they're hadrosaurs with crests. Like Parasaurolophus. Mm-hmm. And Munkaria is small. It's a small one at about 11 and a half feet or three and a half meters long, and it weighed about 550 pounds or 250 kilograms. But it had a fused brain case, so they know it was a mature adult. Yeah, that's really small for a hadrosaur. I'm used to hadrosaurs being like 30 feet, maybe even 40 feet as adult. Not 11 and a half <laughs> feet. Yes. It's like smaller than some raptors. Yeah, and this one lived in the late Cretaceous, the late Maastrichtian, so... When we're really used to the big stuff. Yes. What's especially interesting is they also found a humerus and femur from larger hadrosaurs in the area, and they think that it's likely that at least three hadrosaur species lived alongside each other. Hmm. So this was just the small one? It's not that they were all small there? This one just happened to be a smaller species? It's not the only small species because there's another one, Ajnabia, that was named, I think, in 2021. That was another small one. But they found that Munkaria is different from Ajnabia because of differences in the shape of the jaws and the way that the teeth look. So this shows that there's more diversity in hadrosaurs than previously thought in what's now Africa. And it could be that they were all in different ecological niches. The author said that finding hadrosaurs in Africa from the late Cretaceous is, quote, perplexing because Africa had been isolated from Laurasia by deep seaways since the mid-Jurassic while hadrosaurids evolved in the late Cretaceous, end quote. Yeah, I remember with Ajnabia, the name means stranger or foreigner because of that, that they were surprised it showed up. And then the species name is Odysseus mm. after, you know, maybe it went on a voyage across the sea kind of thing. Yes, because Ajnabi is related to European lambiosaurines, so they think it might have come over water from Europe. So it's possible these hadrosaurs at some point swam or rafted to Africa. Hmm. I did really enjoy the depiction of the rafting dinosaur that we got in Prehistoric Planet. Mm -hmm. There's a dinosaur sort of on some flotsam from a big storm and it just happens to get washed on shore somewhere and then there's another of its type. So you can see how they were starting like almost like an invasive species <laughs> in a new place. <laughs> kind of on accident. Mm -hmm. So Munkaria bata, that's M-I-N-K 
Q-A-R-I-A, if you want to look it up, was found in mines by locals from the same area where Ajnabia was found. The full name, Munkariabata, means beak duck in Arabic. The holotype includes jawbones and a brain case, and it had this short, deep, lower jaw. I like beak duck as a name. Me too. It works with the whole hadrosaur being duck-billed dinosaurs. Yes. <laughs> oh, this one had a low tooth count for lambiosaurines. Between 27 to 29 or maybe 30 teeth on the upper jaw, and usually there's more than 30. But Ajnabia also had a low tooth count, so it's kind of interesting they got these things in common. And they think it could be because this dinosaur was on the smaller side. That's why it had fewer teeth? Mm hmm And like we were just saying, hadrosaurs in Asia and North America were really big. Yeah, especially at the end of the Cretaceous. Mm hmm European hadrosaurs tended to be a um, bit smaller, and then African hadrosaurs also seemed to be on the smaller side. They also found a lot of shark teeth and fish fossils from the area, as well as mosasauroids, sea turtles, plesiosaurs, and some crocodilians and pterosaurs. And compared to the other fossils found in that area, dinosaurs are rare. But scientists over the years have found titanosaurs, abelosaurs, and of course, the other hadrosaurs like Ajnabia. And the dinosaur fossils tend to be found as isolated bones, and that may mean that they floated and bloated, and then they fell apart from being from decomposing, and then scavengers get into them because they see some shark feeding traces. Oh, yeah. Do they float and bloat, or do they bloat and float? Which comes first, the bloat or the float? Good question. I think the, it goes bloat, then float. <laughs> then decompose. Then pop, then sink. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and get eaten. <laughs> Or maybe it's get eaten, then pop, then sink. Yeah. Because it depends on the exact circumstances. Yes. Well, that's cool. It's not just spinosaurs that come out of Morocco. Mm-hmm. There's also small hadrosaurs. <laughs> small beak ducks. <laughs> beak ducks. So up next, I've got this new monograph, as it's called, on Mantellosaurus. And a monograph is sort of just a really long description of a dinosaur. Very detailed. Often one that's been previously described. They call them monographs, but I guess you could have a monograph of a new dinosaur. Yeah, that's happened. It's often years in the making. Yeah, this one definitely was. It was written by Joseph Bonser and others and published in Monographs of the Paleontographical Society. Fitting. I don't think we've talked about them before, but I guess they do a lot of monographs. And it's free to read online, which I would recommend if you're interested in Mantellosaurus or Iguanodontian dinosaurs in general, because it's really well written and it has a great history of Iguanodon, Mantellosaurus, and details about them, as well as the Isle of Wight in general, which is where they were found. And this monograph, we've been waiting for a while because I remember talking to Susanna Maidman when they must have been recently after they had taken the Mantellosaurus out of the case in the Natural History Museum in London and scanned it. They had, what, all three days to scan it or something? Yes, yeah, we talked about that in episode 401, if you want to hear more about that, and it is a really fun story. And it is a famous fossil, I would say, because if you've ever been to the Natural History Museum in London, you've probably seen the Mantellosaurus. It used to be in an alcove right next to Dippy. So if you're like looking Dippy in the face and you turn <laughs> to your right, that's where Mantellosaurus was. Now it's next to the blue whale since Dippy was replaced by a blue whale. It's kind of below the blue whale. And off to the side. It's still in like an alcove over to the side. Mantellosaurus is a close relative of Iguanodon. Some thought a very close relative of Iguanodon, possibly so close that it would be a species of Iguanodon. Although sometimes it's considered a relative of Aranosaurus as well. But Mantellosaurus is very cool in its own right. It has those famous Iguanodontian thumb spikes on its hands, giving it that sort of permanent thumbs up. <laughs> That's one way of looking at it. That's how I always think about it, especially because usually it's depicted with its hands sort of in that position, like most dinosaurs are with their fingers kind of pointed forward and the thumbs point straight up. It's been estimated to be about 7 meters or 23 feet long and about 750 kilos or 1,700 pounds. So on the bigger side. I mean, compared to the one you were just talking about, but not compared to Iguanodon or a lot of other ornithopods. Yep. 
because <laughs> many of them were multiple tons. Mantellosaurus roamed the Earth in the early Cretaceous, but in human terms, it's been found all over Western Europe. And Sabrina also covered it as the dinosaur of the day in episode 323, if you want to go learn more about Mantellosaurus. The cool thing about the display of Mantellosaurus is that it's in a glass case, so you can walk all the way around it, and that one that's in the glass case is actually the holotype of Mantellosaurus, so you can get pretty up close and personal with those actual original fossils of Mantellosaurus that were found over 100 years ago and really appreciate this remarkable iguanodontian up close. Mm -hmm. When we talked to Susie Maidment about it, she called it, quote, one of the most complete dinosaurs ever found in the UK. And in this paper, they say it's about 80% complete. Oh, nice. It's mostly missing the end of the tail. There's a couple little bones missing from the skull and then some of the hand bones and foot bones and stuff. But since they have a lot of both sides of the animals, you can sort of fill it in. So where they might be missing the right foot, they have the left foot. And since they're symmetrical, you can piece it in. And the same thing with the hands. Mm -hmm. So it, they really know a lot about what Mantellosaurus looked like. I'm sure it can tell us a lot about hadrosaurs, or at least its close relatives, too. Yes. Although we do have a pretty good record of Iguanodon mm. as well. And uh, really... There's kind of an embarrassment of riches with <laughs> Iguanodontians compared to a lot of other dinosaurs where we have a lot less of them. The downside, of course, from Mantellosaurus being in this glass case is that it's really hard to study. And yeah, Susie told us about how in just three days in August of 2019, they took the bones out, studied them, scanned them, and then put them back into the glass case much of that was being done with a lot of people watching mm -hmm. <laughs> while the museum was open. So obviously that was a ton of work. I think they said they were working late into the night and early in the mornings until like 3 a.m. was when they finally finished it up yeah. just in time. I think they were under a lot of pressure to do it quickly. Yes. And this paper is partially thanks to that work. Susie is one of the co-authors on it. After all that work, they could determine if Mantellosaurus was its own genus so Norman named 14 unique features of Mantellosaurus in 1986. They included things like its length, its skull shape, the number of teeth, the number of finger bones, and the general shapes of different bones around the body. This paper argued that none of those are valid. Oh, okay. So in the past, yeah, we've talked about how just more general characteristics of bones aren't necessarily descriptive enough to be a valid criteria for a dinosaur. And what they found was all 14 of those features were seen in other iguanodontians. So since a lot more iguanodontians have been named over the years, none of those features count as unique anymore. But fortunately, even though those 14 features that were considered unique in 1986 and are no longer considered unique, might lead you to believe that Mantellosaurus is no longer valid. They found three new features that they consider unique to this individual. And since this individual is the holotype, that means that Mantellosaurus should be considered a valid genus. Good. In case you're wondering, the features are all in the head and in the shoulder blade. Specifically, the premaxilla, the very front of the snout, has a ridge at the very tip. You can even see it in the 100-year-old original drawing of the holotype. It's got this little ridge basically right down the middle tip of the nose. You could think of it. It's pretty subtle, but it's definitely there. The maxilla, which is sort of the middle and back of the upper teeth in the jaw and the bone that holds them, has a tab of bone that sticks up and back towards the eye, which is a unique feature. And the scapula or shoulder blade has a hook-shaped process where the shoulder blade attaches to the collarbone, which has a very steep angle to it that you don't see in other iguanodontians. All details that you probably can't find unless you're looking really closely. Yes, and even though they sound a lot less significant than the number of teeth or something really dramatic about the dinosaur, they can actually be more useful, these subtle things, for identifying a dinosaur because if it's a consistent feature that you see across all of them, they're less susceptible to things like the size of the animal and individual variation. 
One cool thing I wasn't expecting is they also described some skin impressions from the original surrounding rock. Nice. It includes some really small scale details from near the right forearm. Although it's too bad that they didn't have the hand impression to go with it. Mm. Because I'd love to know if that thumb spike had a big claw on it or something. But what they did find is that there were a lot of little tiny scales ranging from round to sort of elongated to polygonal and from under one millimeter to about three millimeters across. It's all very small. Mm -hmm. If you're familiar, they called them basement scales, what are sort of like the base layer of scales. And there are also larger shapes that were left as impressions in the rock that might be the result of creased skin pressing into the dirt before it fossilized. So it's sort of like a, a wrinkly skin pattern pressing in. Hmm, interesting. Yeah, at first I thought like maybe they were really big inch across scale type things, but they don't think that's what it is. They think it's more likely that it's just a skin pattern. We don't really think about that too often. We're thinking of skin impressions. Yeah, sometimes you see it with the footprints, like the little impressions in between the toes, mm. that kind of thing. Good point. So if you're a big fan of Mantellosaurus, it is considered valid. Good. And there's a whole monograph on it. Yep. You can check out all the pictures. There's a lot of 3D scans. They even did like all the ribs individually, very thoroughly documented. And we'll get into Myasaura and some news about just how active it was in just a moment. But first, I'm going to pause for a quick sponsor break. As promised, I've got a news item that talks about how hadrosaurs grew, specifically Myasaura, the good mother lizard. And Myasaura has been coming up a lot for us lately because it just popped up in our On This Day series where we mentioned that it became Montana's official state fossil in 1985. On this day? On Well, on February 22nd, which is not the day that this episode is coming out, but it's only a few days before. And the On This Day series is... Oh, yes. <laughs> on our social media, because we've been celebrating the 200th anniversary of Megalosaurus, I kind of gave myself a challenge to find a dinosaur-related event for every day in February and did manage to find it. Some, I will say, were easier to find than others. And uh, some people noticed. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> My favorite thing about when you were trying to find something for every day of February is I suggested, well, maybe we can get AI to come up with the few days that we're missing. So we, we did a prompt to like, tell me something significant that happened in dinosaur science on these four or five days. And every one of them, it completely made up. Yeah. There were no basis in reality for any of them. One of them was like T-Rex was named in February on this date in like 1997. Like, I thought it was 1970s. It was way off. Yes. <laughs> it was the wrong month and off by, yeah, nearly 100 years. It was ridiculous. <laughs> <laughs> so definitely fact check. And I would not trust paleontology answers on AI language learning models. Not at this point. No. But back to Myasaura. So it turns out it was an active hadrosaur, and they grew quickly and they used a lot of energy. This was published in Paleobiology by Roger Seymour and others. And I mentioned it's the good mother lizard. That's because when it was discovered, it was the first evidence of dinosaurs taking care of their hatchlings. The Myasaur took care of the eggs and raised their offspring for more than a year after they hatched. I guess it makes sense saying that it was active and... All that because, I don't know myasaur specifically, but other dinosaurs where we have eggshells, they've done the paleothermometer thing and seen that they were 100 degrees Fahrenheit-ish. Mm. And usually animals that are that warm tend are to be active. fairly active. Yeah. So they didn't look at the temperature in this study. What they did do, well, they studied 49 fossils that were found at bone beds at the Two Medicine Formation, and they used this technique where they looked at the foramen, a hole in the leg bone where the blood entered. And the size of the foramen is related to the size of the artery and blood flow rate. This is important because these active dinosaurs, they had the micro fractures in their bones from various stresses and strains from locomotion moving around and just bearing their weight. 
and their leg bones went through bone remodeling to repair themselves. Okay, so it's sort of like constant stress, a little bit of damage, and then being repaired yeah, over time. exactly. And so you can see this under the microscope, and it's all related to the blood flow. And the blood flow rate is related to energy costs, like how much energy it takes to grow. Hmm. I don't think we've ever heard anybody try to use that technique before, or at least we haven't covered it. Yes. I think this technique has been around, but this is the first time that they've used it in this way. So Myasaura grew fast. It got to 440 to 880 pounds or 200 to 400 kilograms at two years old. <laughs> Whereas the average human at two years old is maybe 30 pounds. 20 to 30 pounds, yeah. Like a tenth to a twentieth of that. And then it got even bigger, Myasaura did, because it grew larger than 3.3 tons before their teenage years, which are their adult years. Mm. And we know this because eggs, hatchlings, and juveniles have been found. So the team was estimating blood flow rates to the shin bones of Myasaura. And they found that the younger Myasaura had much higher blood flow rates, like 15 times higher in a hatchling compared to an adult. Hmm. And four times higher in a one-year-old juvenile compared to six to 11-year-old adults. So this helped show that rapidly growing juveniles had these high metabolic needs for remodeling their bones. And it takes a lot of energy to build those bones. Because that higher blood flow rate correlates to a higher metabolic rate? Yes. Interesting. I never thought about figuring out blood flow rates and how it relates to metabolism and that you could actually see that from a bone before. That's really interesting. It is. What's interesting is you can see this in some modern animals. Similar things happen to the western gray kangaroo, apparently. Like the joeys grow fast and they have higher blood flow rates than the adults. Hmm. I guess that was probably part of the inspiration for the study. If they knew that about kangaroos and somebody goes, wait a second, maybe we can find that in a dinosaur bone. Could be. I think the one of the authors had used this technique to study other aspects of dinosaurs before too, and they thought, well, why not apply it to myasaur in this way? Hmm. Just another, I mean, not that anybody really thinks this anymore, but that old idea that dinosaurs were these slow lumbering <laughs> mm -hmm. beasts is just another example of how they were much more active yep active grew fast they were doing stuff <laughs> 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 and it worked out well for hadrosaurs because they got very successful we talk about that all the time cows of the cretaceous sometimes we call them the horses of the cretaceous yeah but I'm actually back on cows of the Cretaceous because this next paper found that they were so successful because they were good at chewing. And when I think of chewing, I think of cows yes. more than I think of horses. Yeah, horses aren't famous for their chewing. Not like <laughs> cows, at least. <laughs> <laughs> so this study was published in Paleontology by D. Frederick K. Suderblom and others. And again, hadrosaurs, they lived all over the world in the Cretaceous even Africa. Even Africa. I mean, they're they're pretty cool. They're no sauropods, but <laughs> I feel like they don't get enough credit in the dinosaur world. They don't. <laughs> they're a very successful group of dinosaurs. And again, a big part of that is how they eat their food. So hadrosauroids could chew their food. And we usually think of chewing or mastication as something that mammals do. But other animals did chew, including hadrosaurs. And this made it way more efficient to process their food. And that meant that they didn't have to spend as much energy foraging for their food. In this study, the team looked at the lower jaws of hadrosauroids, dentaries, and they studied 84 dentaries of at least 36 species. And they found a lot of changes from juvenile to adult, especially in those lower jaws. The idea, too, is that these hadrosaurs needed to be more efficient at eating because they grew so fast. Yeah, so I guess the, the grinding the food down more means you get more nutrients out of it. Mm -hmm. So it's more efficient in terms of the amount of calories you can get out of the food compared to how much food you put in your mouth. Yeah. And you need all those nutrients to get those high blood flow rates. <laughs> I guess so. <laughs> <laughs> so as they grew... 
the dental battery got longer, they got more teeth per row, and then the toothless part of the jaw changed, and it made it so they were able to grind down more plant matter on larger surface areas. Uh, Their beaks also got bigger, so it was easier to crop more plants. And they also had this row of teeth where nerves and blood vessels were filled with dentine before erupting. That's calcified tissue. And that meant that the teeth in that row could be completely ground down from chewing without interrupting taking in the food. Yeah, the way the (laughs) teeth grind down just sounds awful. It does, but it didn't hurt them. I presume they didn't have a lot of nerves going on, or if they did, you know, they got used to it and it didn't bother them that much, but... I think that calcified tissue helped. Wearing the teeth down to nothing, just, oof. Their teeth were different from ours. Yeah. Oh, they were very different. That's true. And like a lot of these dinosaurs were getting new teeth about once a month, Mm -hmm. so... It's no big deal. Yeah. (laughs) I guess in that way, it's less important to have a lot of sensitivity in the teeth because if you're just going to get new teeth all the time, it doesn't matter if one of them is having a little bit of an issue. Whereas with our teeth, there's an evolutionary need to know that something's wrong with that tooth because you got to keep it for so long. Mm -hmm. Well, that's cool. Definitely one of the most interesting things about hadrosaurs are their teeth and those dental batteries. Help them out a lot. Now, I've got a listener suggestion that we've been sitting on for a while while we waited for a episode about ornithopods, basically. And the suggestion is, quote, have you heard about the Missouri dinosaur? It is really interesting and should have new papers out sometime in the next five years. The man who fought to bring attention to it and preserved the site passed this year. I would love if you guys mentioned the dinosaur and Bruce Stinchcomb in an episode. He deserves more attention than has been given to this dinosaur and man. It took a decade for the paleontology community to believe that there was a dinosaur here in Missouri, and it seems his name is being removed from the papers on the dinosaur since he passed, and I would also like his name with the dinosaur to help keep his contribution known. Please help expand the knowledge on this man and this dinosaur. It is an interesting history so far, and some characters you know. I believe Cope gave an opinion on it, but there have been discoveries and new specimens since then. I don't want to say too much, as I have been talking to those who are working on the site, and I don't know what is and is not published. A longtime listener, Air. End quote. I just wanted to read that whole thing because I enjoyed it. And thank you, Air, for the suggestion. Yes, thank you. So I believe what Air is referring to, actually I'm pretty positive, is Hypsobema missouriensis, a.k.a. Parasaurus missouriensis, and it is a very interesting dinosaur. Mm -hmm. It's the only named dinosaur from Missouri, and Hypsobema was our dinosaur of the day back in episode 269. Mm, It's been a little while. while. Yeah. (laughs) Hypsobema was named by Cope back in 1869 from a few bones found in North Carolina, although that was a different species. That was Hypsobema crassicata, and the crassicata means thick tail. Mm. When they found the Hypsobema in Missouri, they noticed that it had a similar tail, fairly thick tail as well, and that was part of the reason that it got lumped into the same genus. But over seven years later, after Hypsobema crassicata was found, The Chronister family found a dinosaur in Missouri while digging a well, and in 1945, Charles Whitney Gilmore and Dan R. Stewart named it Neosaurus, but that name was taken, and so they switched it to Parasaurus, and Missouriensis was the species name for both. They thought it might be a sauropod based on some of the details and sort of doing a process of elimination of what dinosaurs might be in the area, but in 1979, Donald Baird and Jack Horner lumped it in with Hypsobema, and that switched it over from being Parasaurus missouriensis to Hypsobema missouriensis. Which is the name that stuck. Yes, for at least quite a while. Then geologist Bruce Stinchcomb, that Air mentioned, bought the property and started looking for more fossils, and since then several more individuals have been found. Nice. In 2004, Hypsobema missouriensis was named the official state dinosaur of Missouri. And around that time, we also found out that there are Tyrannosauroid and Dromaeosaur or raptor fossils from that same site. 
which is really cool. Mm -hmm. But unfortunately, the remains aren't good enough to identify them beyond just those broad categories of something Tyrannosaur-ish <laughs> and some kind of raptor. But they could always find more fossils or maybe they'll notice a unique detail about it and be able to identify in the future. But that's where it is right now. In 2018, a review of Appalachian dinosaurs by Chase Brownstein said, quote, this dinosaur is likely assignable to its own genus, Parasaurus, as it is not only separated from the localities where the material assigned to H. crassicata was found, but also is now known from more material, which may allow for detailed description. Therefore, the name Parasaurus missouriensis is preferred herein. End quote. I remember that because I remember looking into the state dinosaur of Missouri and getting a little bit confused. Yes. And we have talked a little bit about Parasaurus slash Hypsobema with the state dinosaur and also with those other individuals being found and things over the years too in other episodes, but those were much shorter mentions. So mm -hmm. I didn't catalog all of the episodes we've talked about this dinosaur in. So then Hypsobema was made the state dinosaur again in 2004, and it remained until 2022. But in 2022, following the work of Stinchcomb, the Missouri state government actually changed the name of their official state dinosaur from Hypsobema missouriensis to Parasaurus missouriensis, which we talked about at the time, which was really cool because they were keeping up with the science. Yeah. And they both have the species name missouriensis, so I don't think the legislature cares all that much. It works very well as the state dinosaur <laughs> for Missouri with Missouriensis. There used to be a full-size sculpture of Parasaurus at the Bollinger County Museum of Natural History, but that museum closed in 2022. I'm not sure exactly where the sculpture ended up. There was a news story I watched where they were interviewing the person who used to run that museum, and they were talking about basically they sent off everything in the museum to other museums hmm. to make sure that it stayed on display and everything, but they didn't specifically mention the sculpture. It might be in the nearby library. That's where some of the sculptures and stuff ended up, but it's a pretty big, I mean, it's a life-size <laughs> ornithopod. Yeah. It's a big sculpture. So you it, need the space. Yeah. It's sort of like curled up around a nest too. So it's not even standing in a way where you kind of put it off to the side. It needs like a lot of floor space. So I'm not exactly sure where it ended up. If anybody knows, let us know. Yeah. But it's a very cool dinosaur. It is. And I, I like the history of how it started out as a preoccupied name mm -hmm. and then it got lumped in with Hypsobema and then it came back around to Parasaurus. It's just very interesting. A lot of twists and turns. And it's just really cool too because it's the only dinosaur that we have other than those unidentified theropods. It's the only one that we have from Missouri. Mm -hmm. And it's in this, I, I saw one quote from a geologist saying basically it's a miracle that there's any Mesozoic rock at all exposed in Missouri because it's basically all covered in dirt. There isn't a lot of exposed rock in Missouri and the dirt apparently isn't very good for preserving fossils. So it makes it really challenging to get older fossils out of the ground. So pretty cool. That is cool. And hopefully sooner rather than later, there will be some published papers on these other individuals that were found and it'll sort of solidify that Parasaurus naming because some people are still holding on to Hypsobema since a lot of this stuff hasn't really been fully published yet. Well, we'll keep an eye out. We're going to switch gears onto Ceratopsians from Hadrosaurs in just a moment, but first we're going to take a quick break for our sponsors. All right, switching gears. I don't think we had any requests in the queue at the moment for Hadrosaurs, so that's how we ended up with a Ceratopsian. <laughs> this is Titanoceratops. It was a request from Victrix via our Patreon and Discord, so thanks. It's a good name, Titanoceratops. Mm -hmm. It was a Chasmosaurian Ceratopsian that lived in the late Cretaceous and what is now New Mexico in the U.S., and chasmosaurs, they're known for their large brow horns and the big frills. And one of the most well-known chasmosaurs is Triceratops. 
So Titanoceratops was a large ceratopsian. <laughs> I hope so. If it's named Titano, if it was small, <laughs> that'd be pretty disappointing. Yes. And it looked a lot like Triceratops. It walked on four legs. It had the short tail and the large frill and the two horns above its eyes and a nasal horn. And being a ceratopsian, it also had a beak, a rostrum, because that's that was my big takeaway from our Ceratopsian episode was that's what makes it a Ceratopsian, is that beak. Titanoceratops is one of the largest known Ceratopsids, which, like you were just saying, Garrett, based on its name, maybe that's not surprising, is estimated to be about 22.3 feet or 6.8 meters long and estimated to weigh 7.2 tons. It's big. Yeah, although Gregory Paul estimated in 2016 that it was... 21.3 feet or six and a half meters long and weighing 4.9 tons. Still big. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it was similar in size to Triceratops. There's a large Triceratops was estimated to weigh about seven tons, but there are larger Triceratops. There's one that's estimated to weigh 7.8 tons. Also big. So it's in the same ballpark, but yeah, it is a little funny that it might be smaller than a Triceratops, even though it's Titanoceratops. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> So the skull of Titanoceratops that's been found is incomplete, but it's very big. It's about 8.7 feet or 2.65 meters long. Yeah. Now, uh, Titanoceratops is a controversial genus. It was named in 2011 by Nicholas Longrich. The type and only species is Titanoceratops oranos, and the genus name Titanoceratops means titanic horned face. It refers to the Greek titans and also refers to the dinosaur's large size. The species name, Oranos, is after Oranos or Uranus, the father of the Greek titans. And it's named based on a specimen that was originally thought to be Pentaceratops. This is where the controversy comes in. The holotype, OMNH10165, is of a partial skeleton with a mostly complete skull and jaws, including a section of the frill, and also vertebrae, ribs, parts of the arms and legs, parts of the pelvis, and ossified tendons. The holotype was found either in the upper Fruitland Formation or the lower Kirtland Formation, because the original site where the fossil was found has been lost, unfortunately. They haven't been able to find the quarry where it was found so far, but they do know that it comes from an area with fine-grained sediments with flecks of orange amber. Oh, that's cool. Mm -hmm. Flecks of amber in the sediment. So that helps narrow it down a bit. Yeah, that doesn't happen all the time. The fossils were first found in 1941 in New Mexico by J. Willis Stovall, Juan Langston Jr., and Donald E. Savage. And then they were prepared and mounted not until 1995. 50-something <laughs> <laughs> years later? Yeah, because for a long time they weren't considered suitable to be mounted because some of the bones were crushed and fragile. Oh, yeah. Yeah, a lot of times the ceratopsian frills especially can be really in rough shape. Yeah. They can get pretty broken to bits. But it was eventually put on display in the 90s at the Oklahoma Museum of Natural History. Now, Pentaceratops was common in the area where the fossils were found, so they identified it as Pentaceratops and apparently reconstructed the frill to look like Pentaceratops because, again, <laughs> they, they didn't have the whole frill. Yeah, and when it's broken in pieces, it's like it takes a lot of... Not artistic license, but interpolating where the bones would have been, mm -hmm. what the exact shape of the frill would have been, too. Yeah, and so then in 1998, Thomas Lemon described the fossils as an unusually large pentaceratops, because again, it had been found in the same area. Longridge, however, found titanoceratops, the same, these fossils, to have more shared features with Triceratops and Taurosaurus than Pentaceratops. And that was kind of what started going down to study it and figure out that it was a separate genus. In a blog post, Longrich, who named Titanoceratops, said that Pentaceratops was, quote, highly variable, end quote, meaning some specimens had certain features that others didn't have, and that one very large skeleton, that one that was mounted at the Oklahoma Museum, seemed out of place, especially the skull. And he said that it looks more like Triceratops and that the parts that did look like Pentaceratops, quote, the characteristic butterfly hornlets on the midline of the frill weren't real bone, they were just sculpted out of plaster, end quote. Oh, <laughs> interesting. Yes. 
So in the paper where Longridge named Titanoceratops, he identified 22 characters that made the specimen different from Pentaceratops, including its large size, weighing over 11,000 pounds or 5,000 kilograms, and a femur, a thigh bone, that is straight and vertically oriented. Now, this femur is similar to elephants and sauropods and would have helped support its weight. To give you an idea of how big it was, one of the brow horns is nearly 36 inches or about 91 centimeters long. Oh yeah, that's big. I think that's about like a triceratops too. Mm. So Longridge said it was unlikely that the large specimen was so different because of individual variation because its frill and horns were, quote, too extreme and there were differences in the sinuses and nasals, which don't usually have individual variation. He also said that its distinguishing features weren't related to its large body size, as there are ceratopsids that are about the same size with similar derived features, like the brow horns coming from behind the eyes and having really long, strongly curved horns. Now, in addition to being much bigger and probably weighing over twice as much as a typical pentaceratops, titanoceratops, or the newly named titanoceratops, had large, forward-curving brow horns that were more like triceratops than pentaceratops, and it had a nasal horn at the front of the nostrils, also like triceratops. There's also more details, like the edges of the frill looking more like torosaurus or triceratops frills, not as rod-like as other pentaceratops specimens. Hmm. And Longridge said that ontogeny, or growth, didn't explain these differences because the specimen has features that indicate it's a mature adult such as fusions in the bones and a rough texture on its skull. And other pentaceratops specimens are also adults, but they still look different. He wrote, quote, The simplest explanation that fits the facts is that OMNH-10165 is what it appears to be, a giant ceratopsid related to triceratops, end quote. He did say it would be helpful to find more fossils, especially an intact frill, to know for sure. Yeah, that's always helpful. Yeah. He also found that Titanoceratops is a sister taxon of a clade that includes Eotriceratops, Triceratops, and Taurosaurus. He's Team Taurosaurus. And he named this Triceratopsini. Now, compared to Triceratops, Titanoceratops had a longer, thinner frill, a longer snout, and its brow horns were a bit bigger. Titanoceratops also lived about 8 million years earlier than Triceratops. It's estimated to have lived about 74 million years ago. Longridge suggested that Titanoceratops could even be a direct ancestor to Triceratops. That's funny because you would think a good name for it then would be something like the earlier Triceratops, Mm. but there's already Eo Triceratops, which means (laughs) Dawn Triceratops. I guess they had to go a different direction with the name. Yep, go with the size. Now, not everybody agrees with Titanoceratops being its own genus. Some paleontologists argue, no, it's really a large pentaceratops. And Thomas Lehman, who didn't mention Longridge's titanoceratops when he did a later study in 2015 on that specimen, the OMNH-10165, he still called it pentaceratops. Hmm. And in 2020, Denver Fowler and Elizabeth Friedman Fowler found that titanoceratops was pentaceratops and that the specimen seemed unique because it was very old and very large. Oh, that's interesting because I guess a cynic would point out that they're on team Triceratops is the same as Taurosaurus. They're always lumping together these (laughs) Ceratopsians. Yeah, it seems like one of those cases where you just need more fossils to help settle the debate. Yeah, and it's it's sort of a definition question of Mm -hmm. like, where do you draw the line? Which it's hard to draw the line. But for the sake of this segment, we're just going to say Titanoceratops. Yep, I mean, even if it is the same as pentaceratops. It just becomes a junior synonym. Mm -hmm. And that means that whenever you say titanoceratops, everything you say just applies to that one specimen, which is now a pentaceratops. Yes. It's easier to say titanoceratops than (laughs) OMNH10165. It is, yes. (laughs) But anyway, it lived in a wet, well-forested area, and other dinosaurs that lived around the same time and place include the tyrannosauroid Bastahiverser, the troodontid quote unquote Sorornitholestes robustus, the dubious theropod Peronacodon, an indeterminate ornithomimid, hadrosaurids, including Parasaurolophus, the Pachycephalosaur Stegoceros, and the Ankylosaur Notocephalosaurus, and also the Ceratopsian Pentaceratops, if Titanoceratops is valid. 
and other animals that lived around the same time and place include fish, turtles, crocodilians, and mammals. And our fun fact of the day is that there aren't any known dinosaurs that shrink as they grow up, but there is at least one animal that shrinks as it grows up, and that's the paradoxical frog, also known as the shrinking frog. (laughs) Oh, yes. One of our patrons brought that up. Yes. So in episode 480, I said that there aren't any animals that are born big and get smaller as they age, as far as I know. And as always, whenever you make a a statement about this surely doesn't happen in the animal kingdom, there's some weird animal out there that does exactly that thing that seems to break the rule. And on our Discord, Jurassic Pirate said, there is actually an animal that shrinks over the time of its own life, the paradoxical frog, or Pseudus paradoxa, Starts off as a massive tadpole, but the adult frog is smaller than its tadpole form. So weird. (laughs) Yeah. The tadpole isn't just a little bit bigger than the frog. It's about three times the size (laughs) of the frog. (laughs) It's both longer and I assume heavier because it looks bulkier in pretty much all the directions as a tadpole as it is as a frog. The tadpole is absurdly large at up to 27 centimeters or 10 and a half inches long. Hmm. I have never seen a tadpole over about two to three inches. I can't imagine seeing a nearly foot long tadpole. I saw an account of like a seven or eight inch tadpole that was found somewhere else. And the researcher who found it thought it was a fish at first, Mm -hmm. which is definitely what I would think if I saw a 10 inch long tadpole, although... At the later stages, you may know, tadpoles have legs, so that's kind of a giveaway that it's a tadpole and not a fish, because fish don't have legs. Most fish don't have legs, I'm going to say, because I think some fish do have legs, (laughs) but not in the same way that tadpoles do. After metamorphosis, the frog is a totally normal-sized frog, actually maybe even on the smaller size compared to how big it is as a tadpole. Hmm. So the frog is up to 7.6 centimeters or three inches and frequently is smaller than that. And that's the measurement from snout to vent, which is the standard body length measurement for frogs. It's longer if you include the legs, but it's still not even close to the tadpole length. And it's really interesting because The vertebral column is in that snout to vent range, actually a little bit less because that includes the head. And with the tadpole, it's got vertebrae running down the whole length of it. So its spine basically has to shrink way down to fit into the frog, which is really weird. Yes, that is weird. (laughs) Yeah. So like, I mean, if you look at human development, for example, as we grow up, proportionally our spine shrinks because we start out with this spine that goes the whole length of our body and we're sort of fish-like and then over time some of the vertebrae sort of disappear and fuse into what becomes our tailbone but we're also growing bigger as that happens so there's never a phase where we have like three feet of spine and then we're born with a foot (laughs) Mm -hmm. it's it changes as we get bigger in this case it actually shrinks which is just so strange paradoxical one might say Mm -hmm. it's also i think really interesting because frogs don't have tails but then i double checked and there is a tailed frog with a short tail of course there is yeah (laughs) i learned my lesson and remember to check myself before i made a statement about something not existing like a tailed frog but that's too much for this fun fact so to connect this back to dinosaurs Dinosaurs don't go through this major transformation like a tadpole does into a frog. So it's unlikely that we'll find a dinosaur that shrinks as it ages, at least to that same extent. But there are lots of animals who shrink proportionally as they grow up, including dinosaurs. For example, a juvenile T-Rex has arms that are proportionally bigger as a juvenile than they are as an adult. They also have longer legs as a juvenile than as an adult, proportionally speaking. Mm -hmm. Like mammals, a lot of dinosaurs also had proportionally larger heads and eyes as babies, which we find very cute, probably because that's how our babies look. Makes sense. (laughs) So there's an evolutionary reason. More bobblehead-y. Yep. There are also some dinosaurs that have specific body parts that shrink 
on an absolute scale as they get older. Depending on who you ask, the claws of T-Rex shrink on an absolute scale as they get older. Obviously, that's not the case. If you think Nanotyrannus is valid, then it's just that Nanotyrannus has longer claws than T-Rex. But there's another theropod with a shrinking body part, and it's the beaky Jurassic dinosaur Lemusaurus. Oh, what shrinks? Well, it also has very short arms, but that's not the part that shrinks. Lemusaurus loses its teeth completely as it gets older, and the toothed snout is replaced with a beak. Hmm. So its teeth are what shrink. (laughs) And also, depending on who you ask, the horns on the back of a pachycephalosaurus head shrink as it gets older. That might be the best example because the youngest form, or Draco Rex, has... Depending who you talk to. Yes, <laughs> if you lump them together. So Draco Rex has these large horns and hardly any dome on its head. Then the medium-aged individual, or Stygimoloch, has about the same sized horns as Draco Rex, but it has a much larger head and a big dome Then the oldest form, or Pachycephalosaurus, just has little tiny bumps where the horns used to be, and then this massive dome on the top of its head. That's why it's known as the dome head. Yes. So although it has a growing dome on the top of its head as it gets older, it also has shrinking horns, which is still very, very weird to me. Nature's weird. Yes. And I mean... Compared to the paradoxical frog, which is three times bigger as a tadpole, I guess horn shrinking isn't really all that strange. Yeah, that seems like nothing. (laughs) (laughs) And that wraps up this episode of I Know Dino. Thank you so much for listening. If you like this episode or if you like I Know Dino, it would really help us out if you left us a review on your favorite podcast app. Stay tuned. Next week, we'll be covering more new dinosaurs, including a new ankylosaur. Hey. Mm-hmm. Thanks again, and until next time. Good day.